Uh, let's this, um, calling the meeting of uh, the public safety health, <clears throat> public and the public health. <laughs> All right, yeah, the public health uh, uh, subcommittee calling that to order. And uh, uh, this is for anybody who's recording. This is uh, uh, Monday, uh, October 4th. And uh, we'll take the roll now um, among the uh, committee members. Uh, uh, Tim Wessel. Here. Ingrid Jonas. Here. Uh, Julie Holberg. Yeah. Uh, Danica Scott. Here. Gina Cranwickle. Present. And, uh, and Mark Gorman here. Sorry, I didn't identify myself. Mark Gorman. Uh, do we have any uh, public comments that need to be uh, shown or reviewed right here at the beginning of the meeting? Uh, we did not receive public comments for this yeah. week, um, right. for today. And there are also no minutes to approve today yet, Mark. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm uh, going to hand the ball off to you, uh, Gina, and, and uh, let's, uh, let's see what we have in, uh, in store this week. Excellent. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. We are um officially switching our gears just a little bit away from warning symbols and warning uh, language as we've turned that over to dr levine's team so that they can see the work that's been done to date and give their input and weigh in we did ask for feedback by next week to give them ample time to look at it since we have our first um and only milestone due on october 20th so that will coincide with everything here and so i'd like to point out that uh, the two things we're going to talk about today have to do with um, food products and food labeling and then also um, to go back to a discussion on limiting youth exposure for those under 21 to cannabis and just some considerations there um, and also uh, share a tiny bit of research on some of this um, as it relates to a couple of things in those areas. So um, Gina was kind enough to help us this week by um, doing some research with us on um, what Vermont requires for food products. So before we take a look at this and just look at a basic um, labeling of Vermont food products, one of the things that um, we have been in discussion with the CCB on is to get experts in for this committee from the Agency of Agriculture and also the Department of Health as it relates to um, food products that will be containing cannabis. Julie, did I say that correctly? <laughs> yes, I think so. Okay. Excellent. So um, in Vermont, there is a little bit of oversight from each committee on different, I mean, each agency on different areas. So um, getting folks in that could speak to the committee on that um, as an expert testimony will be probably immensely helpful to all involved, especially um, as recommendations are put forth for the CCB. So in Vermont, um, and this is from the Agency of Agriculture, um, they have a guide to food labeling that basically if there's food products in Vermont, it has to identify it and identify it by the common name of the food. Um, what the quantity is, weight, volume, or number um, of products or pieces, the responsible party for the food, um, the list of ingredients, and then also nutritional labeling. So here's where this gets interesting, and this is similar for me in Texas, is that if you are a food manufacturer for, say, a cottage food, and you make less than $50,000 a year, it, it falls into a no label required. You can basically sell things that, I mean, as long as they don't require refrigeration. So it appears that Vermont has something similar um, with those who make less than $50,000 a year don't have to provide a nutritional label, which um, one of the things that we think could be in consideration with some of the other newer states, such as Illinois or Michigan, not looking at their specific requirements, they're all very new states. So there may be some 
item that kept them from having to put a nutritional label on some of the packages whereby California has been doing this for so long, or it could just be an actual requirement. So um, the subcommittee can make the recommendation um, you know, as it relates to food labeling, uh, as long as we stay within the confines, I, I would assume, of what the, the law says. Um, but at the same time, this is a cannabis food product. So um, we'll definitely would like to get some expert opinion weigh in on that. Uh, Julie or anybody else on anything, anybody would like to add to this? And then I'm going to show a quick label or, or Tim or, or um, Ingrid. OK. And then, Julie, I didn't ask, do we have members of the public today? We do. We have two members of the public today. OK, fantastic. So um, the FDA did an update to their nutritional label. And so um, they did it a few years back. But this is what the label should look like and, and what the expectation is from the FDA. Um, there is one of the California packages for sure um, I know had the calorie count on it. And incidentally, so did um, one from Maine that um, Julie shared with us. So they did have a nutritional label for both of those. So um, what we'd like to have is some understanding from the respective agencies on what the expectation may be for food labeling um, of a cannabis product, such as an edible or um, a drink or something of that nature. Any questions on this? This is truly an intro to what's coming next, so please, you know, feel free. So as I just mentioned, there are two departments. There um, is the Agency of Agriculture, which is responsible for labeling, and then the Department of Health, which is responsible for, say, retail food establishments, and I'm pretty sure manufacturing um, possibly as well. And if not, then it would be under the Agency of Agriculture. So we are seeking expert advisors to talk about this and specifically what we would need from the subcommittee um, on this to provide ample recommendations as it relates to this area. Any questions or are we ready to? And today may be um, a shorter meeting depending upon how much everyone you know has to say. So I'm going to move over to limiting youth exposure. Um, public health and safety and some considerations. So Mark and I had a discussion this morning and there were some interesting elements where I believe there is going to be some crossover between compliance and enforcement and what might limit youth exposure. Meaning um, one of the recommendations that we've seen uh, and that was, this happened in California, is where they require uh, no dispensaries within a thousand feet of a school, a daycare center, a playground or a youth center. Um, and so Mark and I were talking and he said some of that may be compliance and enforcement, but then there is an advertising element because there is still a logo or a dispensary name or something that would be seen. And then um, one of the ones I read today was very interesting and that is limit or no curbside service if children are in the vehicle. Again, that may be more compliance and enforcement, but the advertising of that as a service may fall under public health and safety because of the the advertising element, or at least the the um, considerations of of a disclaimer or a warning. So I definitely put that in there. And then what I am unclear on is what the towns may be able to do or say, and if we need to take that into consideration. So Tim, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on um, a couple of these areas, especially because uh, you representing Brattleboro. Uh, would that be now? <laughs> uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, I, you know, there's still, to, in my mind, a little unclear on the zoning aspects of this, like what powers the, the towns have. It doesn't. It looks like it's pretty locked in on zoning at the moment, from my understanding. But um, it it occurs to me, you know, something like if. If the state of Vermont sets a rule of no curbside service if children are in the vehicle, I mean that's not a uh, that's not observed. As far as I know, maybe there's you know it's a completely unenforced thing which happens all the time in towns and on the state level. Can you pull up to um, when I pull up to my local pizza joint that serves me margaritas? Um, nobody is going to check to see if my son is in the back seat. Um, so as far as like parity, at least with something like alcohol delivery, which 
as you may know, have been pretty much lifted um, since COVID started. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would just advocate for, it would be another example of something that local um, police force, if any, would certainly not be enforcing. Um, okay. and, and that's not in the statute, just so you know, that was one yeah. of the I read today. Um, I'm, I'm saying that I wouldn't even support it, including it, unless there is an existing rule for alcohol, and then we should just talk about whether it's, you know, even makes any sense to include okay. more regulations versus less, less. regulations. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Um, Ingrid, anything you want to add? Mm, not at this time. Okay. Thank you. So you know, there, I, I would just, if I ahead. can just butt in here, I, I think what uh, Tim just had to say is a lot of wisdom to it. Um, having looked at it from a long, long time from both the alcohol and the cannabis perspective, I think parity is really w what this whole thing has been about um, in terms of legalizing and uh, availability and so forth. So, you know, there may be circumstances where alcohol or cannabis ought to be subject to more rigorous uh, standards, but uh, in general, I think parity is a good good direction to go in. Excellent. So the other, um, one of the other important items is age gating on websites. Um, there's a lot of um, information, statistical information out that age gating doesn't necessarily work, but is really a requirement. Um, Texas A&M just did a, a study that I'll share with everyone on age gating and um, what what their research showed. But there are there are a couple of different kinds of age gating opportunities. This particular first one from Freshly Baked is an actual website for uh, a place in uh, Massachusetts. So they have a Are you over 21 years of age? Yes or no? And then Jim Beam says, hey, you know, are you of legal drinking age? Please enter your birth date. So it's not a yes or no question. It does require you to think just a little bit more, but that's what you're looking at in terms of age gating um, to, to make someone say they're 21 or not. And we all know there's realities where everybody can get around anything, but um, in parity with other states and everyone else, um, I, I would say that this would be something that you would want to require of any dispensary because it is a 21 or older product. Does anyone have any thoughts on that or agree that that should be there or disagree? So I just want to ask, I've seen those before. Um, it's basically just the question of, are you over 21? You click the box, yes, and then there's, and that's it. And that's it, correct. Yeah let okay. you in. Yeah, uh, just extra step. And then the second way is the extra step, like I see more often than not in alcohol. And I went to several different websites with the Massachusetts um, Cannab Cannabis Retailers Association or something like that. And almost every one of them was clicking a yes or no. Actually, they all were, all the ones that I saw. And I, I hit like four of them to see. Um, so I think that's uh, something that I did want to put forth. And um, if, you know, if you two would like to make your recommendation on, you know, what your preference would be, we can certainly put that forth in the recommendation. I mean, again, having no public real expertise in this area, but I think having the need to enter your birth date is, uh, the minimum. Okay. That be. If you're if you're trying to gate anything, um, it certainly is uh, makes one a little more nervous if you're trying to get away with something. Yeah. If you need yeah. to enter your birthday. I think that's very fair, and it makes you think. You have to. Ingrid, thoughts? No, I totally agree. I've like, again, no experience whatsoever, but in the websites mm -hmm. where I seen this it seems like at least that extra step of having to do the math before you lie about your age <laughs> <It's probably laughs> sorry but yeah I, you know i we looked at that when i was at the stilt spirits council and uh it's obviously 
you know, voluntary. Uh, it's not it's not foolproof, but there is some inhibiting factor that that does help keep uh, underage people out of the uh, uh, out of this. And just even the thought that maybe what you say here could be cross referenced with right. what some other people know is, um, you know, that's also part of the the that inhibiting factor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so um, the subcommittee members agree that for age gating, we want them to input a birthday. And these are plugins on websites, so it can go either way. We'll, is that a yes for both of you? We'll put that. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to go back here as well um, and talk about some other areas that I think are very important and would love your feedback and um, and maybe even some decisions on as it relates to um, things you've seen even in the packaging. So this is dispensaries may not for advertising or logo development use things like toys, inflatables, movie characters, cartoon characters, visuals of appealing foods and bright colors, names that might appeal to minors or any other display depiction or image designed in any manner to be appealing to anyone under the ages of 21 to promote cannabis or the dispensary. And where this comes into play, truthfully, as we all know, there is a massive amount of subjectivity in this um, in terms of what someone may determine is subjective or not, which is why the CCB being able to review um, materials is so important in here. Um, and then there to be some guidelines. So uh, again, this is the list we've looked at a while back, but I'd, if anybody has anything you think that is missing, we certainly would like to to know that as well. I can't think of anything that's missing. I, I do have a quick personal observation is that yesterday we were, my son really has no interest in television or movies, which is very great. He's three and a half. Um, but he loves commercials. So, uh, so during the Red Sox game, there's this alcohol commercial that involves, you probably have seen it if you've watched any of the playoff games, but it's a bunch of fruits flying up in the air and kind of smashing against each other. And it's an alcoholic beverage, but it's just nothing but fun and deliciousness. And it's very attractive to a three and a half year old. Um, so that kind of, I mean, that's covered by these bullet points. Um, if that's the intention, then it makes you think, you know, as far as parody is concerned, you know, has that gotten through on the alcohol thing or not? You know, because they were definitely visuals of appealing foods in bright colors. <laughs> that's basically all the commercial was. Just throwing that out there as an anecdotal. Yeah. I think that's important. Um, because I am seeing more and more of that. Mark, you want to comment? Yeah, uh, well, professional sports uh, games are, as I understand, overwhelmingly uh, adult um, you know, programs. And so they probably pass the 85% um, threshold uh, for a Red Sox game. <clears throat> but, um, but, you know, uh, there are these other rules, and Danica has sort of uh, laid them out here. And and if it is designed to appeal to young people, then it's it's not legal. So um, it's an interesting uh, conundrum there. Yeah, it, it absolutely is, and I think where it's also important for the group to consider. I mean, just the sheer nature of most edibles, the word often used is gummies and gummies is, you know, so that's that's a decision or something that has to be considered. But at the same time, where there's an interesting element of fact here is the common name of the food comes into play with labeling. So there's definitely needs to be some consideration, um, you know, to the board. Um, on, on recommendations with things such as that, as, as I think we all remember the fruit goobies 
that was from Illinois. That was a real name of a product. And I've, I've seen plenty like that and then some that are nondescript. So it's definitely worth your consideration as the subcommittee members to think about some of that stuff and, and how we could um, reduce the attractiveness of it with some of the names. So I'll go back to, to this piece. Um, and, and I shared early on and I tried to find the article and it's just in somewhere hanging out on my multiple windows of Google Chrome that are open. But there was a case um, written in, a, in, it was Canada, but at a hockey rink, a dispensary had used a strawberry in their logo and it was bright and friendly and uh, very appealing and was at a hockey rink where kids were playing hockey. So the parents, um, you know, requested that that come down. So I think that's why using the second list over here is important. And also with some of the CCB oversight to ensure that it doesn't look like a strawberry shortcake doll or something along those lines um, is going to be important. And I think that's also going to come into play with um, the food products themselves and what that package looks like. I welcome any conversation or thoughts or feedback so that I can take some notes um, as we're putting these recommendations forward. I would just add, um, I know that in some of the packaging that you showed us over the weeks that, and I don't know, this is subjective, but font, different types of font, I think are more, your eye is drawn to it as a child versus an adult. Um, and I don't know how we, I just want to put that out there that I noticed in some of those packages that some of it looked just like what would, it just wouldn't appeal to a child because it doesn't have, you know, goofy looking font or uh, I just put that out there for, <laughs> I don't know how we decide, but I, I think certain fonts appeal to kids. That's very fair. Um, and uh, one of the fonts that I even put on a fake package uh, when we were doing it uh, had a similar look. It almost had that Coca-Cola scripty style look. And um, so there is going to be, a, you know, anything that's visual is always subjective. So you're absolutely correct on that. Um, but it's definitely something that I think has to be taken into, you know, consideration um, with these. Tim, thoughts? No, just, um, you know, it, it's a pretty good starting point. And then, as you said, it's just so subjective. Um, and you get into the gray area of personal responsibility, responsibility and parental responsibility as well. So you just couldn't possibly address um, yeah. every parental concern when it comes to dangers for youth, um, but you have to try to hit the highlights, the, the general themes of not making it appealing to those under 21 is a good one. Agree. Um, I think it wouldn't hurt to put in here um, also resembling television shows. I'm sure you're, well, you said your kid's not interested in TV, but we've all seen Nickelodeon and we've all seen the way some of those things look. Um, and I think that that is, that's an important element as well. Um, possibly we add, you know, not just cartoon characters, but television characters or television shows or something along those lines. And again, it's not to try to necessarily over-regulate, but it might make someone think when they're designing something, mm -hmm. yeah. if we use them enough, you know, or some additional items. So I would welcome any additional feedback on this you know, for our next subcommittee, if anybody feels like there's something that we're missing. Yeah, I mean, on the cartoon line, cartoon or popular culture characters or something like that. I think that's broadens that's up the idea a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I think we all remember that, uh, you know, the government called uh, Anheuser Busch on the on the carpet for using frogs and uh, camel cigarettes for using camels and uh, Boy, if you want to invite the uh, government into your business, you got to be careful about things like that. Or use an organization like uh, Control Board or NACB to 
uh, sort of uh, stand in judgment of a self regulate you know, in a self-regulatory way to try to keep the industry in line. I also agree that, um, and I know this from my own career and working in marketing and advertising, that when I had branding guidelines given to me by whomever I was working with, um, they often would put a visual, a do and a don't. They would say, this is okay and something like this is not. And so I think there is an opportunity to provide examples as well um, that might set good standard, good graphic examples um, of what maybe not to do. Um, and then at least, again, designers or others may have, it, it at least gives them that subjective opportunity to say, mm, maybe, maybe this is the path we don't go down. I was just about to raise my Mickey cup as I <laughs> make a comment. So you know, that's coffee, by the way. So. <laughs> All right, very good. So, um, if does anyone have anything else they'd like to add on the age gating or limiting youth exposure? I know we've talked about, an, you know, an additional education, you know, expanding on the Department of Health's educational website about cannabis. Um, especially now that adult use is legal, they may be able to put some additional information in there um, that will help educate parents on talking to their kids about cannabis. Um, and I'm sure they have some considerations. The FDA has some great stuff on that even alone. Um, but does everyone agree that that's probably something they'd like to see expanded or, or for parents um, to be able to talk to their kids about cannabis? Okay. Excellent. Okay, very good. I did add those couple of additional items over here, and I do think that um, one of the recommendations as well would be the, the do's and don'ts. And it doesn't have to be onerous, but just enough to help folks to know um, when they're putting forth their, um, their uh, packaging or advertising or anything else so that they have enough information to come out with um, possibly the the better thing in the beginning versus being rejected by the CCB or, or whoever is doing reviews and having to go back and do it again. And, and that's what guidelines are definitely designed for. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we actually, um, because we have so much stuff with the Department of Health right now, there's not much more to cover today um, until we get the experts in. And I know Julie is working on that. So, um, I'd like to ask if either subcommittee member has anything else they'd like to add before we move on to public comments and then we'll circle back with Julie on um, on the expert piece. Not at this time. I don't have anything. I just want to make a quick, um, it falls into public comment note. And I don't know if I'll need to follow up because some folks have been contacting me with concerns about warning labels, and I've just been encouraging them over and over again to make a public comment. Mm -hmm. You sent them the um, the link, et cetera. So um, I, I think it's not really my job to comment for people, and I don't really want to sway things by saying that I it really is um, my view, but I was just contacted by a, a group of, like some of them are physicians. It's a Dr. Catherine Antley, and I don't know if you have a record of having heard from that person, but if so, it would be a duplicate comment. So I just wanted to let you know that I am receiving the occasional because I'm fairly high profile and I show up in newspaper articles for the, for the committee. So, um, Tim, are they, are they wondering if you know, like warning labels have any effect? I mean, are they one? Are there, is there some no, kind of concern about that? It's um, it's really they're pushing for a more expanded list of warnings um, that include things like psychosis and suicide attempts. So, the um, I haven't, and I don't really intend to go into the evidence of all this because I just don't have the time, but. I think it should be entered in the public record that um, they are advocating for a more forceful warning label 
then it looks like the direction that we're heading in just for what it's worth. Um, some of them line up with what we've already talked about and others have links to, I don't know if it's um, good science or not. So it would be something that uh, I think Dr. Levine has also re received this email. So it might be something that's on his radar and I'll, I'll follow up maybe at a subsequent meeting just to see if uh, there's been any reaction from his office. So, Julie, I know um, the last time Tim received a public comment, I know Nellie, um, we, we did officially log that, but that's, is that procedure if, if something comes through or should we, the advisors, maybe collect those emails from Tim and put them into one document and share them with the CCB? What's the right answer there? Um, unless there's more detail, Tim, that you think needs to be shared. I feel like the, the comment that was just made should be captured in the minutes as part of the public comment. Um, and we, we can certainly that way uh, bring it up again. Uh, Danique, are you talking about like at the beginning of the next meeting where we discuss the public comments? Yes, so I'm thinking, if you'd like. Yeah, I'm thinking that way, um, if it's captured somewhere, um, then, we can, then we can bring it up at the beginning of the next meeting where we typically review those submitted public comments. Although I think what Tim is also saying is that he's asked this, the, um, Dr. Antley to, to make a public comment so that we can, we can review the details of it. And I yeah. was just trying so, to look and see if I've seen that. I haven't seen it yet. doesn't mean it hasn't, isn't in process somewhere. I think what I'll do is I'll just I'll forward it to the group with no comment and just so it's out there and and you can handle it. Okay. Whatever way you'd like to, if that's okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. So, Julie, we will probably finish early today, but do we have any public comments? We do not. Okay, very good. Well, I would like to remind everyone because this is being recorded, if you would like to make a public comment, you may do so by visiting ccb.vermont.gov and using the public comment input form, um, very easily found on the website. With that, Mark, I believe we're ready to, oh, before we adjourn, Julie, have you have not heard back from our experts yet, correct? I have not. Okay. Okay, we'll um, advise if we'll have the experts for Thursday as we really are um, getting to a point where a lot of this stuff needs to be wrapped up and put into reporting format um, to share. And so um, hopefully we can get someone in on Thursday. And if not, um, I'll circle back with the CCB, Mark and I will on Thursday's meeting. Um, for anybody making public comments, we do they are they are referred to the appropriate subcommittee and we do we all see them and we log them yes so with that i believe everybody's going to get 20 minutes of their day back today mark if you'd like yeah, there being adjourn. there being no there being no further discussion i entertain a uh, motion to adjourn i make that motion all right i'll second it thank you thank you everyone we are thank adjourned you. thank you